big venue if you're so inclined. Um, Thank you for, um, for for joining us. We're really excited to be uh, on a panel here at SOCAP. It's my first SOCAP conference, so this morning was really uh, exciting and, and informative. Um, and we're really thrilled to have a chance to share our collective work on resilience with all of you today. Uh, my name is Amy Armstrong. I'm the Director for Relationship Management at 100 Resilient Cities, uh, which means I have the great privilege of working with cities around the world building their resilience. And we'll, we'll talk more about what exactly that means. Um, We've got a fantastic panel, um, really excited about everybody here, um, and I have the, I'm excited to know a lot of you all and uh, worked with you in the past, so this is great. I'm going to start with just about five minutes of an overview on um, the definition of resilience. We're thrilled to have Dr. Roden here joining us. Um, I'm going to start with just a, a quick overview of our view of resilience. Um, and of our core offerings and how we're partnering with cities around the world. And then we're going to turn it over and have a really um, fun conversation with this, this great panel. Um, so as Dr. Roden described this morning, uh, 100 Resilient Cities is a $100 million initiative to build urban resilience around the world. Uh, it was launched last year in celebration of the foundation's centennial. Um, and we, we selected 32 cities to begin working with in December. Um, we've been on the ground uh, in those cities over the past eight months and have learned just a tremendous amount. Um, and we're in really diverse places around the world, um, from Ramallah to Rotterdam, from Dakar to Da Nang, um, and in three cities in the Bay Area, in Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco um, as well. So, so first off, what, what do we mean by resilience? Um, it's a new track at the conference. We're thrilled that there's a track, um, and it's being used a lot. So I want to spend a little bit of time to share what we mean, and then we're going to have all the panelists also talk about their uh, vision of resilience. So the, the concept originated in the 1970s to describe um, how complex natural systems transform um, and withstand stresses. Uh, it was adopted by engineers to also understand the um, evolution of complex systems and their restoration. And of course, it also has origins in psychological um, uh, understanding about the ability of the human mind to recover after a trauma, particularly um, in children. Um, but at 100 Resilient Cities, we've taken that, we're really talking about the resilience of complex urban systems. And we define resilience as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems to survive, adapt, and grow, no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. So that is a, is a unique definition, and I want to call out two pieces of it um, to help you really understand where, where we're coming from. So first of all, you know, we're talking about resilience of many different systems, of institutions, of communities, of businesses. We're not just thinking about city government in terms of the, the public sector, but really the entire ecosystem that makes up cities. Um, and second, I want to emphasize that for us, resilience is about both um, a, a communities and cities' ability to withstand shocks and stresses. Um, if you think about the way that cities have typically organized themselves, you've got one side of, of the community that's focused on planning for the shocks, the earthquake, the terrorist attack, um, the disease epidemic. Uh, and on the other hand, you have folks who are focusing on chronic stresses, on um, endemic violence, on poverty, on long-term climate change and sea level rise. Um, these things that really weaken the fabric of a city and, and their ability to survive long-term. But we believe that building urban resilience demands an attention to both, uh, and that cities that are better able to handle these slower burning chronic issues will also be better at um, prepared and equipped to deal with the acute shocks when they strike. Mm -hmm. We also don't think that shocks and stresses inevitably lead to failure. We've seen examples of cities who have used a shock or a stress to transform themselves and to improve their development, and that's something that we're trying to, to foster. So quickly, um, our work in, in cities, we provide four main uh, types of support and partnership with, with the cities in our network. Uh, the first is funding to establish a new innovative position in city government called a chief resilience officer. And this is a senior position, um, direct advisor to the mayor with the ability to work across departments to really lead the city's resilience efforts. It's a catalytic investment in rethinking the way that cities are organizing themselves to build resilience. And we're very fortunate to have one of the first CROs in the world uh, on the stage with us here today, Victoria Salinas. <laughs> uh, second, we uh, provide support for that CRO to lead diverse stakeholders in the development of a comprehensive resilience strategy. Um, which will result in a list of actionable initiatives that improve the city's resilience. 
And I want to pause because I think this is a really important part of our work um, for people in this room. Uh, because this, the initiatives that come out of the strategy process in all of our cities are going to be things that are fundable, are going to be things that signal to the marketplace what the resilience building priorities and opportunities are in cities. Um, and so we want to be talking with you as we um, develop those strategies in cities around the world. Third, um, we're providing access to a really interesting suite of tools and research and resources to support resilience building. And again, Dr. Rodin mentioned this, um, that we're working with partners who do big data analysis, reinsurers, energy experts, uh, a really diverse host of, of partners who are gonna work with our cities and helping them implement their resilience priorities. Um, and lastly, inclusion in the 100RC network, which is a, a really rich peer learning community um, where CROs can work with each other and receive training from, from our partners. So, you know, just want to underscore that you know, these are our four offerings in each of our individual cities, but they all represent a larger um, goal to facilitate the creation of a global practice of resilience, that we're making a big investment in 100 cities around the world to really understand what the hard work of building urban resilience is and want to share those lessons more broadly with cities around the world. Um, and I do want to just note that the Bay Area is very special to us, um, and it's not special just to me because I have the privilege of working with, with these folks, um, but the Bay Area is the only uh, place that we have invested in several cities in one region. We're working in Berkeley, San Francisco, and Oakland each, and we all know that shocks and stresses don't abide by jurisdictional boundaries, um, and we don't think that the planning for them should either, and so we're thrilled that all three cities have now appointed their CROs, and um, I'm here this week and going to be working with all three of them, and we're really thrilled to see what kind of collaborative efforts come out of um, the three together. So um, with that overview of our vision of resilience and of the, the work that we're doing in cities around the world, I'm going to turn it over and we're going to have a great conversation and try and lift up some concrete examples of the work that these folks are doing building resilience in their communities and ideally opportunities for you to collaborate with us um, in those efforts. So. Uh, I was told we're not going to do big, grand introductions, um, but just very quickly, I'm honored to have Fred Blackwell, who's the CEO for the San Francisco Foundation and formerly uh, city administrator of the city of Oakland. Uh, we've got Daniel Holmesy, who's the director of Neighborhood Resilience, uh, also the Tony Robbins of Community Resilience, I'm told, <laughs> so you're in for a real treat. Um, Victoria Salinas, as I mentioned, is the, the new CRO for the city of Oakland. It's her second day on the job. So we're going to expect her to know everything about the city of <laughs> Oakland. Um, but she comes to us from the World Bank and has done um, disaster risk recovery work uh, in the Global South and also in, in New Orleans. So she's a, she's a real uh, expert in the field. And then Jason Payne, whose title I'm very jealous of, he's a philanthropic engineer uh, for Palantir Technologies. And he's going to help us understand uh, how to better marshal uh, data and technology to support resilience building. So. Um, Let's, let's get going. And we're going to do, I think, pretty free-form conversations. I've got some targeted questions, but I'd like to try and foster a conversation if we can. So each of your organizations um, plays an important role in building resilience. Um, you know, we've made a point that resilience is new to a lot of the people in the room, so I'm wanting to just take a moment and have you each describe resilience and uh, the kind of work that you do, how it helps build resilient cities. So, Fred? Sure. Um, thank you. First, it's uh, my first SOCAP meeting as well, so it's great to be here and uh, be among a, a group of folks who are thinking about these issues, uh, and I'm glad that uh, resilience is uh, one of the, the topics. Um, I think the way I would come at this is kind of from two directions. One, um, you know, wearing the hat that I have on now at the San Francisco Foundation, obviously uh, our uh, priority is to, and our focus is on nonprofit organizations. Uh, throughout the Bay Area. We provide uh, all kinds of support from general operating support to uh, technical assistance and, and capacity building uh, on areas uh, related to education, arts and culture, community health, and, and the like. And so for us, I think practically, we actually view these community-based organizations and nonprofits as some of the key institutions uh, for resiliency at the neighborhood level, and that manifested itself uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, one way is obviously through uh, the basic services that are providing. A lot of the groups that we uh, support uh, are providing basic social safety net type services, and we think that that is a very important part of uh, the resiliency equation throughout the Bay Area. But I think another very important aspect of the, um, the work 
is um, the social capital component of resiliency. Um, we know from uh, past experience that uh, low-income communities and communities of color are the kinds of communities get, that get disproportionately impacted when there is a, a natural disaster or some other kind of uh, earth-shattering event. Uh, and so we think that we have to uh, invest in those communities disproportionately. Uh, and so for us, uh, this is not a one-size-fits-all or shotgun approach. Uh, we actually think that uh, the likelihood of disproportionate impact uh, will require disproportionate investment in a variety of ways. And I think one of those ways is around social capital and social network. Um, and so that, that's one uh, dimension of, of the work. The other thing I would mention, though, is wearing my previous hat at the uh, city of Oakland. One of the things that uh, struck me when we first kind of responded to uh, the opportunity to, to um, be one of the uh, 100 resilient cities and be a part of that cohort uh, was that your definition of resiliency uh, varies dramatically based on your background uh, and your experiences. So, for example, uh, in Oakland, uh, when the police chief thought about resiliency, he thought about it in a very different way uh, than uh, the public works director or the housing director. Mm -hmm. And just to be specific, you know, the police chief, when he thinks about resiliency, is thinking about response. Uh, how is it that we have the infrastructure to uh, respond when that disaster occurs? Uh, secure the environment, keep it a safe environment, make sure that everybody uh, in the city has the ability to respond uh, and to be safe. The public works people thought about this as an infrastructure issue. What is it that we need to think about from a transportation point of view uh, to um, make sure that we have uh, all of the, the sidewalks and the sewers and the utilities and all those things up and functioning as soon as possible after uh, something bad may occur? Our housing people thought about this as a, a, a soft story issue. I mean, in Oakland, like San Francisco, uh, we have a lot of single-family homes that are um, uh, basically vulnerable to earthquakes. And so uh, for a long time, the housing folks have been thinking about how they respond to that. And so um, that, is, that creates both an opportunity and a challenge when you talk about resilience, because uh, the challenge is that you can often uh, kind of get diffuse very quickly in terms of what people are talking about and what the priorities should be. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the opportunity uh, is that it actually impacts just about every aspect of the workings of local government. Uh, and so uh, the notion of um, uh, supplying a person uh, like Victoria, uh, I think, was a, a great move on the part of the Rockefeller Foundation because those folks will be the glue to um, pull all those disparate ideas together. Um, so I'll stop there. I know other folks have um, ideas, but I just wanted to kind of lay out that I think it's, this is a very um, multi-dimensional issue, uh, and I think it's important to understand that everybody who comes to the table to talk about and think about and strategize around this issue will be coming at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um. I think, uh, first of all, I want to just acknowledge it's an honor to be here. I'm here in uh, the stead of Patrick Ottolini, uh, I believe the world's first chief resilience officer. <laughs> so uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone for the opportunity to come in and, and share a little bit. Uh, uh, in the, building on Fred's remarks, I think they're, they're foundational. I would just put out there that uh, I think there's certain ways to look at resilience uh, in, in, in the construct that we sort of take every day in San Francisco is that Certainly they're the outputs, like you can look at buildings and how they'll perform in an earthquake, you can look at the sewers and see how well they'll perform in an earthquake. But resilience in many respects is really about a condition, a condition of an organism, right? And uh, when we work with neighborhoods, we actually uh, want to help them understand that they need to advocate to make sure that uh, they have adequate access to the kind of support they'll need during times of stress. But we also tell them that resilience is about the ability to maintain that condition. So we look at the five functional elements are, you know, can you govern yourself? Can you communicate? Can you problem solve? Can you organize uh, yourselves to get things done? And can you manage partnerships and relationships? And we believe that really at the essence of resilience is a condition. It's your ability to function at a certain level. And, uh, and we work with uh, not only ourselves at City Hall around those five functional areas, but we also work with our neighborhoods. And 
And being the director of Neighborhood Resilience, uh, you know, I was honored to actually tour the neighborhoods of uh, New Orleans after Katrina with Mayor Lee. And Mayor Lee really saw that the total failure in New Orleans, uh, everything was avoidable. No one really had to die in New Orleans. I mean, the storm had blown over for three hours before the levee started to fail. Everything that went wrong, wrong in New Orleans was an engineering failure, pretty much. Um, and when you build pump houses, but you don't have a backup generator, for example, not a good idea. Um, bottom line is what Mayor Lee saw was a total breakdown in the ability for residents who knew what the problems were to be able to work and trust their government to solve those problems. And that's what you saw post-Katrina was that lack of trust, that lack of transparency, that lack of capacity to work together is really what drove New Orleans into that horrible spiral of five recovery plans before they could actually get back on their feet. Completely unacceptable. And I think what Mayor Lee took away from that was that that this is a social justice issue, that resilience is not a condition that government should have and other folks shouldn't have or shouldn't have to worry about. Mayor Lee wants to move ownership of resilience to the neighborhood level. Anyone who knows San Francisco knows that if you aren't on the same page with the neighborhoods, you're not going to get anything done in San Francisco. Uh, so the truth is, if they're not the same place with you, understanding why the city wants to advance its goals and priorities, you're not going to get it done. And the mayor has prioritized. Uh, that uh, as being a top objective for myself and Patrick and everyone else who walks in the building every day. And I just want to honor sort of Fred's remarks there as saying it's basically the same thing, and that is that if you don't get up every day as a resident and think you have the capacity to succeed in San Francisco, then we aren't done with our work yet. And I think resilience is all about success. Couldn't agree more with both of them. I, when we think about resilience, it's such a broad concept. It basically sounds like everything that needs to happen in a community at once going really well. So the question then becomes, how do we define it in a way, how do we tackle that issue that is basically the theme of the conference as well, igniting vibrant communities, vibrant communities that are thriving, our resilient communities. So one way that I try and think about the concept of resilience and that we in the international uh, development world have started to try and break it down so that, it can, so that we can have actions and we can work together concretely is using kind of five, five pillars of action, so to speak. One, understanding risk. Do we know all the risks in our community? We've talked about climate, we've talked about disaster, social, environmental, so many types of risks that face people in their day-to-day -day lives. How is that information actionable? We've got a scientific community that works on probabilistic modeling to kind of understand the trajectory of those risks, but then to really break it down so that I, as a person in my house on my block, can do things differently and make decisions, all that risk information has to be transmitted to me and available to me in a way that I can do something. Even this week we had the, uh, or last week we had the Napa earthquake, and uh, folks in Oakland who are part of Code for America and other groups uh, took risk information on soft story buildings that was available in a big document like that mapped it, put it on the internet, and now you can figure out whether the place you live is a soft story building or not. That's kind of an example of taking information and putting it in the hands of people so that they can put their personal resilience, they can be empowered to do something about it. A second big focus area is reducing risk. That gets to the infrastructure challenges that Daniel mentioned, the large-scale things like the levees, like seawalls, like all those different things that no one person can really tackle on their own because they take millions of dollars oftentimes, engineering studies, all kinds of, of work to really address the risks the community face. But reducing risk, one ounce of prevention, as everyone knows, really helps in the long run. And, and there's been plenty of studies that show putting four dollars into, putting one dollar into that saves you four dollars down the road. And what we're seeing even globally is partnerships of people saying, okay, let's pick a topic, schools, safe schools. Everyone wants children to be safe. So even knowing what's the risk, are schools safe? And being able to say, this one meets these building standards, this one doesn't, and looking for ways to start to address those things. So using that concept of reducing risk in every type of infrastructure we're involved in is definitely part of uh, the way that we can think about looking at resilience in a, in a way that allows us to start working together. Uh, thirdly, preparedness. The business community thinks of it a lot in terms of business continuity. The, the public sector thinks about it in terms of being prepared to respond to disasters. 
and really investing in preparedness and really thinking through what are those things that we must have in place now that we can be doing now to make sure that we can withstand any shock that comes our way is something that is tremendously important. And I would encourage definitely uh, w whatever organization and, and groups that one is partnering with to have that preparedness be part of a business model to make sure that they're taking into account all the risks in their community. Financial resilience, that's another component where people can work together. And, and it's both insurance for business owners, agriculture earlier today, we heard about a lot of rural insurance schemes, um, but also for cities and countries, being able to really have contingent finance so that when something happens, you can absorb those shocks, you can keep going, you can rebuild quickly. And finally, resilient recovery. We all look to New Orleans as an example of places where after the, the horrible disaster and the, the long recovery process, there's been so much innovation. There's been creative partnerships. All those things that disaster, all those opportunities that come out of that are things that we, could, we can take from and think about now to say, okay, if we're going to have to resiliently recover at some point, especially in this area where we know we're an earthquake country, what are those partnerships? What's the social capital? What's the neighborhood community associations that need to be vibrant now so then when there is a disaster, we're tapping into what already exists. We're not recreating the wheel. We're not creating community in times of crisis. Those are things that are all elements of resilience and pull on different partners, different types of expertise, and create a way to plug into this broad concept that really requires all of us working together and, and really leveraging our various assets to truly ignite vibrant communities and make sure they're resilient regardless of the types of, of risks that they may face. Mm -hmm. So batting cleanup, it's always a little bit difficult to not be redundant. So let me try to give a, a, a different angle on it, and that's a very tactical angle. And to me, I define resilience as actionable insights, uh, the ability to find where those investments are required to improve the ability of a community to recover from an acute shock as well as a chronic stress. And I think the, the real key to uncovering those actionable insights is collaboration. Uh, I'm a data scientist by trade and find myself looking at the world through data. And what I've found is that all of the data across the three sectors in a city is there to uncover those actionable insights, to then make those investments to improve the resilience. It's just a matter of getting all three sectors to work together, sh share data in a secure fashion, et cetera. And looking at the three cities in the Bay Area, you're probably talking about uh, tens of thousands of NGOs, hundreds of governmental entities, and hundreds of corporations that are involved in that equation. Uh, but coming together, you can uncover those actionable insights. Um, one tactical example of this in the first city that Palantir's technology is deployed in Norfolk is understanding vulnerability during floods by taking buoy data, uh, weather data, rainfall data, public 311 data, um, other critical, critical infrastructure reporting data, et cetera, putting it together and developing models to run scenarios that in this condition with this wind direction and this rainfall amount and this tidal situation, here would be the communities that would be cut off based on this critical infrastructure failing, et cetera, and looking at very, with those actionable insights, then being able to make targeted investments to improve the resilience of the community. Thanks for, for that example, Jason. I, I failed to mention that Palantir Technologies is one of the, our uh, founding uh, platform partners, and I actually have been working with the team in Norfolk, Virginia, to develop the kind of modeling that you're referring to, and it is going to be transformative for the community in good times and in bad times to understand the impact of water on, on their resources. Um, that was really helpful. I mean, I think there were some common themes. We heard a philanthropic perspective, a, a public sector perspective, and the private sector perspective, but a, but a real common theme was community uh, and social capital. Um, and whatever, if you're focused on uh, preparedness or recovery, um, supporting and empowering communities and local stakeholders to be a part of that process, I, I really heard as a common theme. Um, but I'm gonna pick up on the actionable insights to, to go to our next question. Because I think, you know, one of the, as I said, one of the key goals of 100 Resilient Cities is to develop resilient strategies that have uh, actionable insights and initiatives and priorities that cities need in order to address underlying weaknesses and some of their key risks. 
um, and all of you have a diverse experience working in municipal governments. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if you could help share some examples of those kinds of initiatives that maybe the market hasn't quite understood yet. Um, we're hoping to aggregate the demand of those 100 cities and share with the marketplace, the philanthropic sector or private sector partners and others um, to understand the needs of communities. And we're early in those days. We know some things about the need for better data, the need for better financing, uh, research on community cohesion, but you all have, have such a great diversity of experiences. I'm wondering if you can share some of the examples of resilience priorities that maybe the market hasn't quite understood yet. And anyone can start there. You don't have to go in order. So one that I think lots of communities are struggling with, and I'm sure you guys can speak to this too, is we'll speak about the Bay Area because we're here now. And um, like Amy mentioned and Fred mentioned, uh, Oakland, like the other cities in the area, are looking at what to do about affordable housing and make sure that it's not going to fall down when there's a disaster. Because we all know that the most vulnerable people are oftentimes the ones who live in the most at-risk area. So there's thousands of apartment buildings around this area that are likely to, to fall down in a major earthquake. So the question that, that the city is struggling with and looking to, to figure out is how do you incentivize landlords who many are owners of rent-controlled buildings, to, to make these capital improvements, to make these changes, because retrofitting is not cheap. And so there's definitely those types of things where there's not a clear source of funding, it's not, there's not a program already set up. Those are types of challenges, that live challenges that we're struggling with right now. Of how do you finance that? How do you do it in a way that minimizes or that on the financing side works, but also minimizes displacement of residents while, they're, uh, while the work's being done. And so that's one, one challenge that we're looking at right now is how do you, if we want to reduce risk, which is one of the things that is important for resilience, how do we tactically do that and finance it and make it work for everybody who's involved in, in the marketplace? Um, and I don't know if you guys wanted to add to that because I know you've been more involved. I, this is my second day on the job, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have more to add on that one. But... Sure. You know, I would add, and I, I would actually uh, categorize it, I think, um, on, on one level, uh, from an infrastructure point of view, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that uh, the, the market, so to speak, has figured out a way to make capital uh, and debt available for the kinds of infrastructure investments that are necessary for uh, resiliency whether that's resiliency uh, that is of the, the earthquake type or resiliency that is related to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, an example of climate change is sea level rise. Um, we uh, have not, uh, and the market has not, put together, I think, uh, effective tools that will allow us to invest in waterfront development, infrastructure development, and other things that will allow for the kind of um, uh, adaptation uh, to sea level rise that I think will be necessary. And so I think that that's one uh, category. Uh, I think uh, Victoria is right on the other category is uh, capital uh, and um, uh, debt available for um, investment in housing infrastructure is also going to be an important thing. The second thing um, that I would mention, and I wanted to give an example, because I think sometimes when we mention kind of the importance of social capital, uh, it's hard to kind of get your arms around mm -hmm. that. Um, for folks who are really interested in a very practical example of how social capital makes a difference in terms of resiliency, uh, there's a book called Heat Wave mm -hmm. um, that talks about uh, the heat wave in Chicago in 1995 mm -hmm. and study uh, the impact by on a neighborhood level uh, and also looked at the mortality uh, at a neighborhood level. And what they found was that the difference between surviving that heat wave and not surviving that heat wave boiled down to a senior not being isolated in their apartment or in their home mm -hmm. and being able to have access to people and information to let them know what to do. And in some cases, it was as simple as the instruction to go hang out in the freezer section of the deli or the grocery store where it was cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And without that kind of social networking, you will find very disparate outcomes uh, in terms of the response. And I think 
the investment in that kind of infrastructure is kind of difficult to get your arms around, but it's definitely an area where we haven't really responded at the level of scale that will make a difference in terms of resiliency. The last thing I'll say, and I'll be brief on this one, is technology is actually important when you talk about resiliency. Um, my mom runs an organization called Policy Link that was uh, very active in New Orleans in the uh, aftermath of Katrina. Uh, and one of the very simple things that they did was create a website for the people who got displaced so that they could have access to information around how to get back, what kinds of institutions you should go to, what kinds of city programs are available, what types of community institutions are there to help you. So the idea of using technology to get the information out and to arm people with the information that they need for their own resiliency and to rebuild their lives is very important. Let me, let me jump in there. Uh, technological and IT infrastructure investments are viewed as overhead, and it's so difficult to raise money for overhead because it's not able to find the marginal utility. It's easy to say you provided 10 extra beds or 100 extra blankets or whatever the case may be. And so I think it's so important for the community to look at investments in data and IT infrastructure as a first order investment and not look at it as an overhead investment and, and kick it to the curb. Um, that being said, overall resilience, I think that the, the underinvested area is around those chronic stresses that exist in a community. And this is primarily around nutrition and health, in my opinion. And this is something that I was on the, the drive up here this morning was reading the report from the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria and how the Ebola outbreak has affected their abilities to do program effectiveness in West Africa. And the reality is there will probably be more people that die from malarial outbreaks because the infrastructure fails and they don't have the ability to correctly distribute bed nets and anti-malarials where they're needed than actually folks that, that perish from Ebola. And so to me, I think it's incredibly important to look at the uh, chronic conditions and the chronic needs of a city, and especially doubly so, how those are affected during the shocks and how those people that are vulnerable before the shocks have those vulnerabilities mitigated during a shock. Daniel, do you have anything to add? I just want to, to sort of add to um, Fred's point. I mean, the, the heat wave example is a very personal thing for me. Um, in 1999, my aunt died in a heat wave uh, in her house on top of Twin Peaks. Uh, and uh, she laid there for three days, and her neighbors drove by because who ever heard of anyone dying of a heat wave in the middle of summer in San Francisco, right? And I think this brings this full circle, and I, I know our colleague here uh, is trying to ring the bell here a little bit about this, is that our planet's changing. Uh, we had two heat waves this year before March. In San Francisco, if it's 85 degrees, that's technically a heat wave. Um, the truth is, our homes in San Francisco don't have air conditioning. And so all of a sudden, San Francisco has been thrust into this new reality where we're going to have a growing, growing, and growing number of events that are heat-related, and the residents are not acclimated, and our homes are not ready to perform. And a lot of the buildings downtown that have been built to see, be energy efficient are now emptying out on hot days because people can't work in them, right? And so there's a difference between resilience and sustainability. That'll be another breakout session, right? But the point is this. This March, uh, this May, I was on vacation, and my father was on a diuretic, and he was, uh, took a Claritin. And he called his doctor, said I wasn't feeling well. Well, guess what? Uh, even though his doctor said drink water, my dad was tired. He went and lied down. He couldn't even make it to his bed. He fell face first on the floor. The first time in 90 years, this man was not able to stand up on his own. And he was heading towards the same terrible fate his, his sister had died 10 years earlier. Well, guess what? You know the difference is? 8.30 in the morning, my brother, who I grew up with uh, next door, not by blood, but by spirituality, checked on him just to make sure he was okay, picked him off the floor and got in the hospital and saved his life. And I want to point that out because in the end, all this data, all this information, if it doesn't point to that moment when we can be there for each other, where we can be a mentor to a youth that's about to turn the corner and make some bad decisions and be a voice from outside that might help them make some smart decisions. If all this technology and all this investment doesn't make sure that at that moment we can contribute to each other's success, then we're missing the opportunity. And I just want to put that out there as a challenge perhaps is how do we make sure that when our chance 
to move forward on our condition and be resilient as a community is before us. How can we make sure we're ready for that moment? Someone was ready for that moment for my dad. I just want to make sure that that's the case permanently for every resident in every city moving forward. Wow, some really personal and important examples. Thank you all. I, I think um, if I some of the themes there again are around the intersection of social capital and investment capital. Sort of how do you structure financing mechanisms that help? soft story retrofits in vulnerable communities ensure the building stands up, but also thinks about what happens to the human beings in those homes after an earthquake. Um, and I appreciate, Jason, the, the thinking about the longer-term chronic stresses, um, how to invest in information um, that will support communities to know what to do in times of, of crisis. So that was, that was, that was great. Um, I think building on the, the relationship between uh, social capital and uh, infrastructure, <laughs> let's, let's move. Um, Dr. Roden this morning uh, presented a concept of the resilience dividend, um, which is the idea that you know, understanding and resilience, uh, investing in resilience not only will mitigate damages um, in terms of disaster, but can have other benefits in the good times. Um, one example from uh, one of the communities where we work, Medellin, Colombia, um, had suffered from um, severe violence and a complete lack of rule of law in the late 1980s and 1990s, um, the city government there made some really tremendous investments in public transportation infrastructure. They built public gondolas that had open community centers. They built uh, public escalators. They built pub bus rapid transit. Um, and so, you know, what was on its face, a uh, transportation hard infrastructure investment um, which did reduce, increase mobility and reduce carbon emissions and all those other things you'd want, also had the, the impact of connecting communities that had been warring, um, opening up uh, neighborhoods, making it more transparent and safe, and had a huge reduction on violence. So um, I'm wanting to get some examples from you all about investments that you've seen that may have been targeted on one thing, a, a transportation infrastructure, um, but had some other really important benefits for social capital or other aspects of, of resilience. So again, anybody who would like to take that. Sure. One thing that's live right now in Oakland, so it's a project in process, um, is the, the, there's an area that goes through lots of different neighborhoods called International Boulevard Corridor. And uh, when we're speaking about, and the point I want to make with this kind of project is that, I, that the way we design our, in, our individual projects and work together and partner, and the way we partner with people can have resilience dividends way beyond one specific initiative, one specific, specific investment. So in this area of Oakland that goes through what they call the flatlands, which is where a lot more of the underserved community is and is also very highly vulnerable to different types of risks, uh, they're looking at an integrated economic development program. So on the surface, it's transit-oriented development. It's looking at all these different pieces coming together, but really, it has an opportunity to bring in partners and, and work with different aspects of those communities and neighborhoods along that corridor to build resilience in a really meaningful way. Not only because it's going to be improving mm -hmm. ac access to transit and connecting people, but it's an area that has many more renters who also have very low incomes, and so the whole affordable housing issue has an opportunity to be tackled. There's people who only the, the labor market there is primarily people who have low-income jobs in, in kind of the service industry and some other industries. And so there's a chance to really ignite and build uh, much more energy and, and, and small businesses. There's vacant lots that have, if you get creative and you're looking, there's so many businesses wanting to come to Oakland and migrate there that you can start to get creative with this corridor about the possibilities. And there, so, a, so the point being that in a specific place with specific people and their specific problems, you can start to bring people together and partners together to really say, how do we make them resilient? How are we building together? How are we achieving and igniting this vibrant community? And so I think that's one place where I'm hoping that over the next couple of years, and maybe even with some of the partners here in the room, since Oakland is looking for partners for this project, <laughs> this initiative, that together we really help this one area be a model for building resilient neighborhoods uh, vibrant neighborhoods and tackling some of these stressors that really are the hardest, some of the hardest things to do. The, the disaster related ones, the big shocks, people don't tend to want to invest in because they think it's going to happen way down the road. So it's that set of challenges. But the stressors, the poverty, the, the low education outcomes, etc., 
have a huge impact on people's ability to thrive now and recover after disasters. Mm -hmm. So that's those types of projects that are place-based, community-specific, really give us this opportunity. I mean, just to add to that, I mean, when Harvard Kennedy School of Government uh, noted that whatever trends are in place, good and bad, before a disaster accelerate. Mm -hmm. So if your local economy is struggling before a disaster, it's just going to get worse, right? Um, an example, just to put out there, and again, I appreciate everyone giving me a chance to share a little earlier, um, is that uh, we had a neighborhood in Vernal Heights where the merchant corridor was struggling because rents were going up, but the small businesses were actually seeing a lot of people leaving the neighborhood to shop at some of the competitive, like, large box stores in the, in the area, and they were like, how can we keep our neighborhood money in our neighborhood. So they created something called Bernal Bucks, right? Which were, they actually attached to $5 bills stickers that said Bernal Bucks in it. And that way, when you went to a store and you used one of those $5 bills, you got an extra 10% off, you got a free cookie or something like that. Now what was important about that was getting people to understand that post-event, your world collapses. You may not be able to get on the freeway and go out to Ceremony and buy a $10 suit at you know, Best Buy or something, whatever. You have, to, you have to stay local. And what it does is gets people to understand the power of a local economy and the power of influencing your local economy. And frankly, what a lot of people are talking about in our neighborhoods right now after disaster is, how are they going to continue to shop and, and share resources if they can't use their electronic uh, uh, currency? And so this idea about creating hyper-local currencies actually nurtures their, their belief that they can actually do something like that. And so the Bayview right now is actually starting to talk about Bayview Bucks as well. And what we're trying to do with our work is not actually come up with these ideas, but help incubate them and then share them through our network of neighborhoods through the Neighborhood Empowerment Network. And I think that's sometimes the best thing we can do is get out of the way um, and let people to connect with each other. And maybe that's part about resilience as well. There's a, there's a big aspect. We've talked a bunch about community being a central part of resilience. And any time that you foster a community, you have massive positive externalities that come out of it. That getting, uh, we were discussing backstage, getting a bunch of disparate actors in a neighborhood to come together to build a resilience plan, well, you have a bunch of disparate actors in a neighborhood coming together, possibly for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incalculable how that collaborative effort and that building of community, uh, getting NGOs and governmental entities and community leaders to work together, how much of an impact that can have on the positive aspects of the community, of individuals stopping by to check on other individuals that may need someone to check in on the day or two, et cetera. So, I mean, the only thing I would do is underline everything that everybody else just said uh, and go back to one of the comments that I made early on, which is that we know, um, based on our experience, that low-income communities and communities of color are going to be disproportionately impacted. What that means to me uh, is that investments in um, addressing uh, disparities, whether they are uh, disparities that are uh, in the educational system uh, or in dis uh, uh, community health issues, uh, environmental justice issues, as well as investments in kind of addressing uh, the inequities in our economy our investments in resiliency, investments that attempt to level the playing field, that attempt to uh, create equal opportunity no matter where you live or uh, where you grew up or what school you went to, are investments in resiliency. And so I think that it's important to um, understand that frame uh, as we think about this issue. That's helpful. I sort of pose the question as if there's going to be some resilience investment down the line, but you all have done a really great job of reminding us that the, the practice of building resilience is, is working with your community um, on long-term goals. It's not waiting for, for the plan and the investment down, down at the end. Um, I think we've got six minutes left. I'm in, I want to open it up just in case there are questions from the audience that, um, that, that are burning that we can, we can share. Yes, sir.
Um, you know, I, I think that you're right. Um, and I think an example of that is the, uh, when the bottom dropped out of the real estate market a few years ago. Um, one of the things that is not talked about uh, very much is uh, that that was probably the biggest erosion of uh, wealth uh, in the African American community uh, that folks have ever seen. Uh, and the impacts of that uh, are going to be felt uh, possibly decades into the future. Uh, because what you're talking about is uh, an inability to pass down uh, an asset uh, that is kind of one of the fundamental uh, assets of wealth creation in this country. Uh, and so I think that you're absolutely right uh, to kind of focus our attention on this issue. Uh, what I will say about it is kind of similar to what I said a little bit earlier, which is um, the way that our uh, economy is growing right now uh, is growing in a way uh, where not enough people are participating in or benefiting from it. Uh, and what that is creating or going to create uh, is a situation where um, our economic health will be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And so this issue around equity uh, and this issue around investing in both the root causes and the uh, effects of it uh, are not things that I'm talking about that we need to do uh, from a moral point of view. Uh, although it should be talked about in that way, it's something that we need to think about and talk about in terms of the sustainability of our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think you're right in, in raising the issue and I think it should be a part of the conversation. I think it's also uh, very important from a global context as well, looking at ethnographic and religious lines and how cities can really be tinderboxes where frankly one nihilist or one anarchist can put an impetus or a shock into the community and just absolutely destroy an urban community. And I think uh, that's something that really should be focused on. The counterpoint there that I think is very important to discuss as well is the importance of using data correctly. And we've talked about people with good intentions being able to use granular data to create all sorts of positive impact, but using that data maliciously can result in severe negative impact. Um, an extreme case in point is if an NGO is on, that's helping a, a, a vulnerable community is on dire straits, selling that data to a payday advance organization may be a way to make ends meet. And the effect that, that would have on that community could be very, very negative. And so I think it's very important to discuss ensuring that data is used correctly, especially in sensitive areas and vulnerable communities. Just want to go back to the whole area of economic preparedness. One of the tremendous benefits of Katrina was um, somehow it inspired all of the country, synagogues and churches, to develop very sophisticated training programs for natural disasters in concert with local government. Nothing like that has happened in the wake of the recession. We did some brainstorming with church leaders there before the recession hit. And I don't think any of the 50 folks that we pulled together believed it was going to hit. But the deacons fund and the little bit of money set aside doesn't go anywhere. But they came up with ideas like a church Craigslist, who's got an extra room in their house, a car in their driveway. And actually started, uh, several churches out of that started financial planning courses. Mm -hmm. Had older people teach younger people how to process food. So in terms of looking forward to resilience, if there's anything you can do to help communities create not only preparedness for natural disasters, but for the ec next economic downturn, because I, I don't see anything going on there. Just one thought on that. I think one of the distinctions uh, between just disaster management and the concept of resilience is that as we make communities resilient, we're addressing those types of things now. We're not waiting till the Katrina happens or the next big earthquake happens to suddenly come together and do our best to work together. We're thinking through those things now, looking for those creative partnerships with the faith-based community, other communities, so that whatever adversity may come our way, we're ready for it. And, and in doing so today, we're actually making our community stronger and more vibrant every single step of the way. I think Daniel's uh, doing a lot of work in this, in this realm, so I want him to, to, to jump in. So uh, just to put it out there, uh, greed is not good. Greed is bad. 
uh, I toured neighborhoods in Christchurch, New Zealand earlier this year that developers were told would dissolve into liquefaction. They sued the city and won the right to develop in 1995. They built 400 homes. They put 400 families in those homes. And uh, three years ago, those homes sunk three feet in 20 minutes uh, in liquefaction. And now that community looks like the, uh, the Ninth Ward uh, in the middle of New Zealand, one of the most socially conscious uh, countries in the planet. Uh, I feel like we all have to take ownership for our actions and our behaviors every day. As, a, as an organism, we're all part of the organism. So if we're not behaving in a way that we think the organism should behave, then we're part of the problem. We need to be part of the solution. And I want to put out there as a, as a, as a uh, my last name is Homsey, Homs, H-O-M-S. Anyone who's following what's going on in the Middle East right now in Syria, you know, uh, my, my ancestral home has been destroyed by what's going on in the Middle East right now. And I just want to put out there that in the Bayview, we have a saying for our work, which is that we want to build a neighborhood worth fighting for that we love every day. And I think we need to go back to the answer. And the answer is love. Love is the answer. Let's love each other. Let's love our communities. Let's trust each other. Let's, let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. Let's take a risk and say hi to a stranger on the street. And as soft and maybe naive that is, isn't that what really being a human is all about, is feeling connected to those around you? So maybe, you know, we should look at ourselves today when we leave here and, you know, if someone wants to cut in front of you and you still are five minutes away from work, let them cut in front of you, you know? <laughs> uh, when you're in a coffee shop, put down your phone and say hi to the person next door because really resumes is all about relationships. And you never know if that person might be the person one day who could see you on the street having a bad moment and could turn it around for you. So I just want to put out there that uh, maybe we should all leave here and, and start focusing on love. That is a very positive uh, <laughs> note to end on. So I'm being told to finish up. I'm going to pose my last question, but we don't have time to answer it. But I want to. I like this last question, so you guys can come up and ask them what their answers would have been. Um, I ask them to all think about, you know, in their work in cities, um, what is one really hard to solve resilience challenge, right? And what's the, what's that nut that they need to crack? And if they were to pitch it to a bunch of investors, what would it be? What would they ask for? So you can come up uh, and talk to them and find out what their answer is. But please join me in in thanking all of these wonderful, dedicated <laughs> resilience warriors.